Hi, welcome to Mr. Dyer's Musings. I'm Mr. Dyer. You know, lighting has been a big part of human existence. This is something that we can share across the world and its importance. Today we're going to be taking a look at another form of lighting that was used in the early 20th century up to about the 1940s. Really pretty popular thing. Stay with me. As always, I like to thank my wife, my family for their unconditional support. I like to thank you guys, my viewers and my subscribers. We're past 400 subscribers now. I can't tell you how much I really appreciate it. I also want to give a huge thank to my patrons on Patreon. I appreciate your guys' support as we keep rolling out these videos. So we've talked about lighting in various forms throughout this series. And if you're new to this channel, we always take a look at artifacts and we try to break down the history, and if they're in good enough shape, we even use them and demonstrate them being used. So if you like history, or if you like artifacts and antiques, then this is definitely the channel for you. In the past, we took a look at you know old flashlights from the 1930s, Boy Scouts. We took a look at fire starting. We even took a look at Marbles, the company that made the famous match case that you can still get today your big box store. But something we haven't really talked about is one of the oldest forms of lighting and that is candle lighting. And I have with me today an artifact that honestly has been talked a lot about on YouTube. If you look up this company you'll find a lot of different videos. So I'm going to try to take it from a different perspective um, and still talk about its history and its use. What I have here is a very compact, ingenious device that was patented in 1906 and again in 1908, okay? This is a Stonebridge folding lantern, and it came in three different types. What I have here is the 10 one, and it's a heavy-duty 10. It weighs about two pounds. They also came out with an aluminum, which, from my research on someone who has an aluminum one, it's very, very flimsy, very easy to uh, break due to the rivets hollowing out. And they also made a brass one. And I haven't seen an original brass one yet. But this is a nice heavy duty 10 one, which I think is probably the most common one. Uh, especially if you look on eBay and past auctions, you tend to see the 10 one. Now this I got from my impression because of its history. Now it goes all the way back to World War I. Now this little lantern was used in the trenches over in the European theater. And the company, took that to its advantage in marketing even after World War I. And there were a lot of soldiers that obviously used them, they brought them back, uh, they fell in love with them, and uh, they, when Camp Craft really kicked off with lightweight backpacking, uh, there's even people like uh, Horace Kephart who suggested having one, and in fact in the museum he, they have one that he carried, which is an aluminum one. Even though in his books he kind of suggested getting one of the other versions because the aluminum was so flimsy. So that's kind of an interesting piece of history. Now if you're lucky enough you can find these marked that have the US Medical Corps insignia which is the Caduce. I don't have that one. But if you see that marking you know that it was used in the military in World War I. So how does this work? This little ingenious thing. As you can see it has a little bail. It has a little snap. And we're going to open this up, bring you a little bit closer so you can see it unfold up close. So as you can see, the writing, the Stonebridge Folding Lantern, patented November 20th, 1906, June 9th, 1908, C.H. Stonebridge Manufacturing Company, New York City, made in the USA. And it's, pat it's uh, signed on this side as well, the exact same thing. Now, I tried to do some research on Stonebridge Company, and I could not find much information at all. There is a contemporary company called Stonebridge, and in its company history, it's not related to the Stonebridge Company. So if you find something, if you know something that I don't, please share it. So as you can see, if you pop open that front clasp, 
everything's kind of spring loaded. If I press down here, you can see it kind of springing back, which is really cool. If you wash the bottom, even this kind of has a little bit of a spring to it. This little brass clasp that you see here is actually a friction clasp so that that bottom base can snap right in. So we're going to push that forward and now it's locked in. So some features of this lantern, which is really cool. So it has a mica uh, lens. Now mica is very clear. The problem is once it gets damaged, it can get kind of cloudy. Also the soot from a dirty candle can also cloud it and make it look kind of gross and doesn't give off much light. It has regulators here on the side that you can slide back and forth to allow more light or more air and less air. And that's really nice on super windy days. You can shut it halfway so it still gets the oxygen to feed the lantern so it's nice and bright. The holes on the bottom are circular, as you see. Both sides have regulator, the front does not. The inside has a polished piece of tin. And what's really neat about this, when I got this lantern, it had an extra mica lens tucked behind this aluminum piece or I'm sorry, this um, this tin, this polished tin. And this side was broken out. So I was able to take that and replace this one with the spare. Now it is kind of difficult to replace it because you have to undo these brass tabs that you see there. And then this comes out. And once you, that comes off, then you can slide the mica in carefully in between these little uh, side pieces. So it is a little bit difficult. Um, if you're out in the field, I would definitely carry a couple extra. Uh, that way, you know, things happen. But mica is a lot more durable than glass. Now, if you look inside, you can see the candle holder. Now, the candle holder is useful because it has two different sizes. So you can get the larger one inch candles and you can stick it in there, or the three quarter inch candles and stick it in the back and it holds onto it really well. Now if we take a look at the top here, the little panels are also spring loaded. You got a little wire there that keeps it sprung open, but that lets the heat escape from the top and also you know the flow of oxygen and when you bring it down it sits down like so and you can snap it into place and now you have your lantern now a nice little feature is it does have the reinforced eyelet so if you put a nail in a tree or in your home or something like that or even if you make a, uh, a little hook you can hang this up if you don't want to use the bale like I said, it weighs about two pounds, and it's very compact. So when you are going backpacking, you can break it down, and it takes no time at all. Fold it back up. Now you see these wires that are going across that are meant to protect it and keep the lens in place can also damage the mica. You pull it down. Bring it like so. And that is the Stonebridge Lantern. Now during World War I, when you're talking about trench warfare, you're, you're trying to think of ways to make things light for campaign duty, especially when you have to leave your trenches quickly, whether they're being evacuated or you get leave. Having something like this that can easily fit in your backpack and still provide you the light that you need that's really important. Now the Boy Scouts sold these even in the 1920s, up until uh, 1937 is when you, they started kind of phasing them out. And that's when I don't know if the company stopped making them, the company started to fizzle out, or if the popularity just kind of 
it does hold up. Ow. But it surprised me that even into the 1930s, that this was really popular, um, and it was sold right next to the uh, flashlights of the time. So like I said earlier, Horace Keppert, who was considered like one of the founding fathers of um, campcraft, he wrote several books, you know, he mentions this. If you look in the Field and Stream magazines, you'll also find these being advertised. And obviously the Boy Scouts of America was selling them as well. So if you're thinking of trying to put together a vintage camp craft kit, then I would definitely pick one of these up. You can get reproductions of these. They're brass, they're a little bit smaller. They don't have all the features like the air regulators, but it's almost identical. Um, and I think it's, uh, in fact, I'll just put a, a link down below in the description for you to find the reproduction though, because I don't remember the name off the top of my head of who sells them. But it's a nice piece of kit, and in, in general, you know, you always want to have three sources of lighting a fire. Now, first, it's definitely going to be a lighter in our contemporary times, but next would probably be your matches. You may have a fire starting kit like flint and steel probably don't want to do your bow drill unless you're absolutely necessary. But having a light source as well, like a candle, is good for fire starting and for your lighting. So a candle does double duty in that way, and having a lantern is going to protect the candle for use so you can use it for the lighting. I hope that was some uh, useful information for you. I hope you liked the video. If you did like it, please click like. Please consider sharing this with your friends and check out the other videos, especially all the other ones that we did, like on the flashlight, marbles, the flint and steel. I got a ton of other camp craft videos and they're just going to keep coming. We've got a lot more on the way. Please like it if you do. Please subscribe. If you have any questions, please ask. Leave me a comment. Tell me if you've used one of these or something similar and how will you like it in comparison to our contemporary lighting sources. Give a kiss and hug to your loved ones and take care.